Welcome everybody to this evening's program. My name is Jennifer Chaika and I'm the Programs and Exhibits Manager at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. I'm here to welcome you to Making Change, a history of LGBTQ activism in the US. Thank you so much for registering to be part of this event and this important topic. Tonight, we are joined by John D'Amelio, who retired from UIC in 2014, but continues to research and write about US since World War II, social movements, the history of sexuality. He's a pioneer in the field of gay and lesbian studies and the author or editor of more than half a dozen books, including Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, The Making of a Homosexual Minority in the United States. And the world turned essays on gay history, politics, and culture. We'll drop a link in chat so you can see everything about John. John has won fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and was a finalist for the National Book Award. When he's not working, he watches old movies, solves Sudoku puzzles, and searches for a New York style pizza in Chicago. So, with that, let me welcome John, your expert for the evening. John, thanks for being here. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for that introduction. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity. So uh, what, I'll be, uh, what, what I'll be doing tonight is providing you with a broad overview of LGBTQ activism in the US from the 1950s when it got started into the early 2000s. Uh, and, and given that time frame. Uh, I want to start with what I describe as the worst time to be queer, uh, the 1950s and 60s in the US. Uh, oppression is really out there. Uh, it's undisguised and aggressive and shows itself in many different ways. Uh, for instance, uh, in 1950, a US Senate issued a committee issued a report titled the employment of homosexuals and other sex perverts in government. And perhaps the most memorable line in it was this one, one homosexual can pollute an entire government office. When Eisenhower became president in 1953, one of the first things he did was to issue an executive order that banned the employment of all LGBT people from federal jobs, as well as jobs with government contractors, so the entire defense industry, for instance. Uh, the military during these years was engaging in witch hunts and dishonorably discharging at least a couple of thousand LGBTQ people every year. Uh, the FBI engages in intense surveillance. They accumulated at least 330,000 pages in its sex deviant and sex offenders file. Uh, police uh, have a great deal of freedom to go into bars, to arrest people en masse uh, because homosexual behavior is a crime in every state. Uh, many cities and states, including Chicago, have laws against what was called cross-dressing, uh, which is gender non-conforming clothing. For instance, in the 1950s and 60s, a woman wearing pants with a zipper in the front could be arrested for violating the anti-cross-dressing laws. Uh, you can get a sense of what this era is like from some of the uh, Tribune headlines and articles from the 50s and 60s. Uh, this is a series of articles uh, talking about this Government Senate investigations, um, moral misfits, sex perverts, uh, immorality in Washington. Uh, here are uh, some examples of the Tribune reporting on raids against gay bars, 58 raised, raided, arrested in one of them, 87 arrested in another. Under these circumstances in the 50s and 60s, it meant that people lived in the closet. Uh, wearing a mask was the phrase that was often used, which meant that people pretended in their lives uh, to family, to neighbors, to friends, to co-workers, that they were heterosexual or gender conforming. Occasionally, someone becomes visible, but it's usually against their will and as an attack upon them. For instance, uh, Bayard Rustin was uh, 
peace and racial justice activist in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He was also the organizer of the 19. Uh, 63 famous March on Washington. And a couple of weeks before that march, a segregationist senator from South Carolina revealed in the Senate that the organizer of this march was uh, a sex pervert. And that senator got his information from the FBI. Rustin survived, but it's a good example of the vulnerability people faced. During this time in the 50s and 60s, the most visible cultural representation of LGBT life were so-called lesbian pulp novels that were sold in drugstores and newsstands everywhere, and they were intentionally scandalous and negative in their portrayal. The covers are offensive. I want to show you a couple, uh, but they capture the time. So here is one called Warped twisted passions in the twilight world or degraded women. So in settings like this, in this kind of a society, how do LGBTQ people respond? What forms of resistance begin to emerge in the 1950s? Well, it's the 50s that see the beginnings of organized political activism, what was described by participants as not a gay or lesbian movement, but as a homophile movement. Um, the three most important uh, organizations from the 50s and into the early 60s were the Mattachine Society, founded in LA in 1951, One Incorporated, uh, which was an offshoot of Matt Mattachine and publishes a magazine called One. And the Daughters of Belitis, which was a lesbian organization founded in San Francisco in 1955. These organizations hold meetings, they have public lectures, uh, they bring doctors, lawyers, psychiatrists to speak to them. They publish magazines. Um, they even have chapters in a few cities. Um, Chicago had chapters on and off of both Mattachine and the Daughters. Uh, but given the times and how oppressive it was, this was a very cautious type of activism. Uh, you know, for instance, would you ever know that Mattachine was a gay organization or the Daughters was a lesbian organization. The names, you know, help keep things quiet. Uh, many participants often used pseudonyms so that they wouldn't be public. Um, and they try to take a very reasonable and responsible stand rather than a militant or angry stand. But even with those limits, they're also life-saving organizations for this relatively small number of people around the country who learn about them, who subscribe to their magazines and receive them every month or every two months. Meanwhile, while this is happening in terms of formal organizations, there are a small number of individuals who do push the envelope during these years. And I'll, I'll mention um, three of them. Um, Christine Jorgensen, the first American to have what was then called sex change surgery in 1952, uh, or gender affirmation surgery. Uh, it was headline making news in the United States and Jorgensen then made her career as an entertainer and remained visible so that other trans individuals could be inspired by her presence. Uh, another person, Valerie Taylor, uh, she was a Chicago-based novelist in the 1950s and 60s, and she took the lesbian pulp uh, genre and transformed it into uh, positive portrayals of lesbian life in these years uh, with titles like Whisper Their Love or The Girls in 3B, A World Without Men. A third person, Jose Soria, uh, he worked in a gay bar in San Francisco and also uh, on weekends uh, did, would, did drag performances in the bars. And in the late 50s and early 60s, when the police in San Francisco really went on the offensive and was arresting lots of people and raiding a lot of bars, Jose Soria 
runs for city supervisor in San Francisco. He's the first LGBTQ person to run for public office openly. Um, and naturally he didn't win, but it was an important statement of courage and resistance. Now, by the time we get into the mid sixties, some of these homophile activists and groups are becoming more visible and assertive. <clears throat> Partly it's the impact of the civil rights movement of the 60s, which is making protest and collective uh, demands for equality uh, more commonplace. Uh, in Washington, DC, you have Frank Kameny. Uh, he, uh, he was an astronomer who was fired from his job with the federal government because the FBI learned that he was gay. Uh, he forms a chapter of the Mattachine Society and in the mid 1960s leads the first public demonstrations uh, to uh, oppose the federal government's ban on hiring uh, lesbian, gay and bisexual people. Here are a couple of images of those demonstrations um, marching uh, in front of the White House and other government buildings. Um, you can see that it's, they're very orderly, they're dressed properly. Um, in 1968, at a conference of activists that were held, it was held in Chicago, activists um, adopt the slogan, gay is good for the movement. And in general, by the second half of the 60s, the upheavals of the 60s are reaching further into the LGBT community. Uh, cities like Philadelphia, San Francisco, and LA all had rowdy, disruptive public demonstrations in response to police harassment of the bar. Uh, trans women who were among the most frequently arrested were often in the lead. Uh, in 1968, the Chicago Mattachine Society begins using the phrase gay power for the first time, uh, building on what the black power movement was saying and doing. Uh, and with all of this happening, uh, in 1969, uh, the police in June in New York City raid a gay bar called the Stonewall Inn and the patrons of the bar fought back and there were several nights of rioting in Greenwich Village. And this really becomes the symbolic marker of a major historical turning point and the birth of what gets described as the gay liberation movement. By the following spring, there is enough new militant angry activism by a younger generation that activists in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles have a march and rally to commemorate the Stonewall Rebellion. And of course, now we have pride parades and marches all around the globe in June every year, and millions participate. Uh, here are some images of the gay liberation demonstrations. Notice how different this looks from those, those earlier demonstrations that I showed you images of all power to Butch Bulldykes, lesbian revolution, all power to the people. And a key element of this new liberation movement was the notion and the call to come out of the closet, reject shame, reject secrecy, reject pretending to be someone you're not, make yourself visible to everyone. And one of the first post Stonewall gay magazines uh, that was published had the title come out. So with this new militant activism, what changes in the 1970s? Um, the first big development is an explosion of organizations. Um, in 1969, after almost 20 years of homophile groups, there were maybe 50 throughout the country. By 1974, five years after Stonewall, there are between 800 and 1,000 LGBTQ groups. Uh, some last uh, for a long time, some come and go quickly. Uh, they have a very wide range of missions. Uh, they're local activist, all-purpose organizations. There are religious organizations like Dignity of, for Gay Catholics or uh, Integrity for Episcopalians cultural organizations, 
uh, that hold music festivals and film festivals and create theater troops, health and social science, uh, social service organizations like in, in Chicago, the Howard Brown Health Center, which still exists, and the first national organizations, uh, organizations like Lambda Legal or the National Gay Task Force. A second development has to do with uh, cultural representation, uh, no longer dependent on what the mainstream press like the Tribune has to say, because organizations are beginning to create a queer press and queer publishing firms. Uh, you have magazines now with titles like Lesbian Tide or Out of Boston, Fag Rag, just putting it out there. Um, one of the most popular lesbian novels ever written uh, came out in 1973 called Ruby Fruit Jungle and was published by a lesbian feminist press. Another development is the winning of allies. In the course from the late 60s through the 70s, a series of organizations like the ACLU, American Bar Association, National Council of Churches, American Psychological Association, and some others all come out in favor of anti-discrimination legislation to protect LGBT people from discrimination. Now, I should mention that in, the, in this period of time, in the 70s, when they were talking about, anti, about discrimination, they're talking in terms of sexual orientation, not yet gender identity. Gender identity is almost absorbed into sexual orientation. Another change in the 70s is that there are some real victories. And <clears throat> I won't go through all of these, but two very, uh, two very important ones. The American Psychiatric Association in 1973 removes homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. The federal civil service ban, the blanket ban is lifted in 1975 and is only limited to jobs that require security clearances. And a few states, and Illinois was the first actually, a few states begin repealing their sodomy laws that criminalize homosexual behavior. You also have uh, some elected officials who are actually starting to come out of the closet and be visible within uh, the Democratic and Republican Party. Um, so some things change. There are victories. Um, but what doesn't change uh, in the 70s? Well, in comparison to what existed before, a lot does change in the 70s, but it's very uneven. And in comparison to how things are now, it's very uh, limited. For instance, the overwhelming majority of LGBT people have not come out. And most of them are not in any way political activists or community activists. It's also an internally within the community divided population, reflecting the divisions of gender, race, class, identity that one sees in the society at large. So, you know, there was a Chicago Gay Liberation Front group that was supposedly for everybody, but then lesbians leave and form Chicago Lesbian Liberation. And the, a lot of the more conservative or non-radical white guys leave and form the Chicago Gay Alliance. And people of color leave and form third world gay revolution. And trans people leave Chicago Gay Liberation Front and form the Transvestite uh, Legal Committee. And in the 70s, <clears throat> there's a whole movement that is described as lesbian feminist separatism uh, because both the gay movement was seen as too sexist and the women's movement was too homophobic. Um, and you know, some of this, these internal divisions are reflected in, inside the community. Like in the 70s, there was serious racial discrimination in gay and lesbian bars. Men and women of color were often asked to show two or three forms of identity, uh, proof of identity in order to be admitted. The other change, the other thing that doesn't change is the um, intense homophobia in the society. And especially uh, 
the rise of an organized reaction against gay liberation in the term in terms of a politicized Christian evangelical movement. The first high profile <clears throat> targeting of the movement comes in 1977 after Dade County in Florida, where Miami is, passes a sexual non-discrimination law early in 77. And at that point, uh, Anita Bryant, who was a beauty pageant contestant, a popular singer, and a spokesperson for the Florida orange juice industry, becomes the leading figure in an effort, a repeal campaign through a voter referendum. And in June of 1977, voters overwhelmingly choose to repeal the non-discrimination law. Bryant begins to travel around the country. Uh, she frames her campaign, as you can see from this, as save our children from homosexuality. Uh, and a few other cities that had passed non-discrimination laws repeal them because of Bryant's organizing. The biggest of these uh, was the so-called Briggs Initiative in California, a statewide proposition in 1978 that would have required the firing of any school employee known to be gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or any school employee who spoke favorably about homosexuality. Uh, it's, uh, and fortunately, the Prop 6 uh, or Briggs Initiative, it failed. Um, it created the biggest statewide organizing campaign uh, that the LGBT movement had seen, ever seen. This was a big demonstration uh, in California of activists and community members against it. Uh, and one result is that of, of all of this, of Anita Bryant and the Briggs Initiative, is that it brings more people out of the closet. It makes people angry and they're willing to fight back. And the pride marches, this one is from New York, the pride marches in 1977 were larger than they had ever yet been. And when Anita Bryan comes to Chicago in 1977 to speak at the Medina Temple uh, in the near north side, it leads to the largest gay demonstration in Chicago's history. So uh, sometimes even political opposition can actually prove helpful to a movement. So by the end of the 70s, we have the beginnings of the society we live in now, some visibility, organizations, political activism, community, some victories, but it's still the early stages of change. And as the 80s begin, things are not looking so good. Um, the election of Ronald Reagan gave the evangelical right uh, a voice in national politics because it was part of the coalition that elected Reagan. And just as this wave of conservative attacks is taking off, something new enters the scene, the AIDS epidemic. And as I will argue, in a way, AIDS changes everything. The first cases were reported in medical journals and the press in June and July of 1981. Uh, groups of young uh, men in LA, San Francisco, and New York were developing a rare kind of cancer and pneumonia, and their, uh, their immune system had mysteriously lost the ability to fight back. The common factor that researchers and doctors are finding is that they all seem to be homosexuals. And initially, AIDS was labeled gay-related immune deficiency. Um, the media begins to talk about risk groups rather than risk factors as other groups are identified like heroin addicts and hemophiliacs and Haitian Americans. Uh, the number of deaths explode. At the end of 1981, 166 people had died in the US from AIDS. By the end of 1992, the total death count was over 194,000, and most are dying within a year of diagnosis. Initially, the, <clears throat> the press was ignoring the AIDS epidemic. Uh, <clears throat> it was only the gay community that was getting aroused. And then in 1985, 
it's announced uh, that Rock Hudson, who was an iconic Hollywood star in the 50s and 60s, he was revealed to have AIDS. Uh, he dies of it, as many do. Uh, but it, suddenly the feeling is if Rock Hudson has AIDS, anybody can get AIDS. And it's all because of those homosexuals. And it creates the publicity around Hudson creates even more panic and hysteria. There are proposals to quarantine all gay people, uh, to compulsorily tattoo anyone who's diagnosed. Uh, people are evicted from their housing. Some hospitals and doctors refuse to treat them. Uh, Congress passes an amendment to the Budget Act uh, that says no federal funds can be used to promote homosexuality, which has implications for AIDS education. How do you educate people about safe sex? So there's almost no government response for several years during the Reagan presidency. Uh, Reagan doesn't say anything about it for five years. But it mobilizes the LGBTQ community like never before. The first response <clears throat> is initially local self-help. Community health organizations get created, uh, like the gay men's health crisis, for instance. Uh, lesbians uh, who had gone off into this separatist world in the 70s get very involved in the AIDS education movement. There's political organizing locally to get cities and county public health departments to respond and to get money for treatment and education, and especially to do risk reduction education. Now, just as all of this is happening, um, both the community response, but also the tragedy of AIDS, in 1986, in a Supreme Court decision, Bowers versus Hardwick, the Supreme Court rules that state laws that criminalize homosexual behavior are constitutional. And the language is really offensive. It says they have one quote is no such thing as a fundamental right to commit homosexual sodomy. Uh, the arguments of the plaintiffs are facetious. It would overthrow millennia of moral teaching. And the decision is enraging. So if you combine Hardwick with AIDS activism, uh, the change impact is tremendous. And one example is in 1979, before AIDS, 10 years after Stonewall, there was a march on Washington for lesbian and gay rights that got maybe 100,000 people. In 1987, there's a march on Washington against AIDS and for lesbian and gay rights, and it gets half a million people. Another uh, uh, form of change that occurs is that by the end of the 60s, the community and the movement is going beyond self-help and local responses and mobilizing the population as never before. And the key, the key moment comes in 1986 and 1987, uh, a New York activist named Larry Kramer, who is a well-known writer and uh, a screenwriter for Hollywood. He had published a novel called Faggots, which was a, actually a pro-gay novel. Um, and he writes, first he writes an article called 1,112 and counting the number of deaths and says, if we don't get angry, we will all die, and writes a play called The Normal Heart, which gets produced around the country and is about AIDS. Uh, and in 1987, he gives a speech at the New York City Lesbian and Gay Community Center that was a call to arms, and out of it comes the formation of a group called ACT UP. AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And for the next several years, ACT UP chapters form all around the United States. Uh, they engage in really militant demonstrations. They disrupt the New York Stock Exchange. They conduct a die-in in Daly Plaza. They block the Golden Gate Bridge during rush hour outside San Francisco. They invade the Food and Drug Administration in Maryland to get more money and research. Um, uh, and, um, excuse me, something just came up on my, let me, uh, 
Okay. Uh, and they engage in a demonstration against the Catholic Church in New York, whose cardinal had been very anti the community and very homophobic. Um, to give you a sense of what some of those demonstrations look like and the anger and the message, uh, we'll go through um, some images. Silence equals death became the major slogan of ACT UP. This is a demonstration in Chicago against Cardinal Bernadine. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the poster that was reproduced all around the country. Again, they're very out front, they're very angry, they do not hold back. Ronald Reagan, he kills me. Uh, for many blacks and Latinos unable to afford AIDS care, the cost of living is too high. I want to give you two more uh, after this. Uh, uh, this is Danny Sotomayor, who was a Chicago-based activist in ACT UP, who was also a political cartoonist. Uh, and uh, one of his cartoons, you know, uh, this is a picture of the senator from North Carolina who had blocked funding for AIDS. Uh, and here he's saying six million dead from AIDS. And an image of Hitler saying, sounds like a good number to me. Uh, and Sotomayor's cartoon circulated in the LGBTQ press around the entire country. Uh, another thing uh, that was done to mobilize people and raise the issue was the creation of the Names Project Memorial Quilt in 1987 in San Francisco. Uh, it allowed people to uh, create a quilt panel for family members, friends, partners who might have died of AIDS. And the quilt was displayed for the first time at the 1987 March on Washington. It was displayed on the Washington Mall. And it, it, it really humanizes the, the epidemic and the cost in lives. And I'll show you some images of this. Um, you know, the, the images reveal something about the person. So here, you know, is sort of the Mexican flag or the school that this man, schools that this man attended. Uh, Neil, who was a cellist, um, this was made by uh, the daughter of a man who died of AIDS. Uh, this was made by the neighbor uh, uh, who had grown up next door to this fellow. Uh, Roger Gale Lyon uh, died of AIDS uh, and was one of the first activists who uh, actually spoke out in Washington, DC. So um, by the early 1990s, uh, this is starting to make a difference. Uh, we're beginning to see progress finally. Uh, in 1990, Congress passes the Ryan White Care Act, uh, which provides uh, a great deal of funding for AIDS education and services around the country. Uh, it passes the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 and included in the Disabilities Act is HIV positive, makes you a disabled person who can't be discriminated against. And in 1992, um, um, a real marker of change is that Bill Clinton's presidential campaign, he became the first major presidential candidate of one of the two parties to actively seek out the votes and support of the LGBTQ community. Now, I said earlier uh, that AIDS changes everything. Uh, let me give some more examples of what I mean by that. Um, first of all, lots of people come out, far more than in the 1970s. Um, it grows, and this grows exponentially as the number of cases rise, because now coming out and being honest seems a matter of life and death for the community. Uh, and it's happening almost everywhere, you know, from a uh, big university uh, from big cities to university towns to small towns to every region of the country. Um, the 1987 March on Washington, which brings half a million people from all 50 states, 
has a, a tremendous effect. People go to the march and they come home and they've been changed forever and become activism, activists. Another change, um, throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s, almost all LGBTQ organizations were volunteer run. Um, and, you know, that's hard uh, because, you know, you might run out of time and you can't do it anymore. Uh, but AIDS, uh, leads to a massive increase in community funding for activist organizations so that more and more groups are able to hire paid staff, which means that they grow quickly and can be much better organized. Um, AIDS also leads the LGBT community to reach out and um, form alliances with other kinds of organizations, uh, with nurses, doctors, social workers, prison administrators, boards of education, public health officials. Uh, and initially that work is about AIDS education, but it easily slips over into LGBTQ issues and issues especially of sexual orientation. And it's no accident that in 1986, New York, and in 1988, Chicago, both pass non-discrimination laws based on sexual orientation. And then the last thing that I, well, one of the last things I'd mention here um, is that it leads to a big change in electoral politics. A lot more openly gay and lesbian candidates start running for office. Uh, uh, the activist organizations uh, work with elected officials, they lobby in Washington and do things that they had never done before. And this kind of change that I'm talking about, it doesn't stop here. Um, it leads to other kinds of change. Um, it leads to a much greater visibility and organizing among LGBTQ people of color. Uh, organizations like Yego, uh, the Latino, Latina, Lesbian, and Gay Organization. You can see the names here, the National Black, Lesbian, and Gay Leadership Forum, uh, the National Minority AIDS Coalition. Um, another example of visibility in Chicago in 1993 for the first time, uh, people of color marched as a gay and lesbian contingent in the Bud Billiken Parade on the South Side and an a Chicago organization of women loving women Latinas formed in 1995. One of the things that makes this possible is that because of AIDS funding, organizations like these are able to get funding to hire staff and work in people of color communities. But then again, as they start doing that, they also begin working on um, issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and related to that, one of the other major changes is that the AIDS epidemic leads to much more visible organizing among bi and trans. Um, bisexuals were horribly targeted in the 1980s because of AIDS. They were the ones who were being blamed for spreading AIDS into the general population. Well, they begin organizing. They create a national organization, Binet, in 1990. And when there's another March on Washington in 1993, this time it's called a March for Lesbian, Gay, and Bi Rights. AIDS also leads to more visibility among transgender individuals. Uh, they, many of them were especially susceptible to AIDS and were disproportionately affected, but they're also ignored by the quote, gay organizations. Um, they're not being included in the non-discrimination laws. Um, and so they begin to really uh, fight back. Uh, a new transgender literature begins to appear uh, in the course of the 1990s. And by the mid 90s, people are starting to use the, the short term phrase uh, LGBT to uh, indicate inclusion. And another significant change that occurs in the course of the 80s and 90s that really reaches 
<clears throat> into the society at large and has a tremendous impact is a much more visible presence in the culture, so different from the era of lesbian pulp novels. In 1993-94, uh, you have Philadelphia, a movie with Tom Hanks, where uh, he gets an Oscar for playing a gay man with AIDS. Uh, Tony Kushner's play on Broadway, Angels in America, about the AIDS epidemic, which wins all sorts of awards and then travels around the country. <coughs> um, the MTV, one of its first, one of the first reality TV shows called The Real World, features someone named Pedro Zamora during this year, uh, who is a Cuban American who has AIDS and who comes out about it. And then, of course, uh, in 1996 97, on the TV series Ellen, the character of Ellen as well as the real life person, Ellen DeGeneres, over the course of that season gradually comes out uh, until you finally have Oprah Winfrey on an episode as her psychiatrist saying, come out, come out. Um, uh, this is a picture of uh, uh, Zamoro uh, who really did break TV barriers by coming out on the real world. There's also a, a, a new level in, of involvement in national politics uh, that occurs in the 90s. The gays in the military debate in 1993, where for six months, it's a national news story as to whether gays will be allowed in the military. Uh, the outcome is the don't ask, don't tell policy, which is a bit of improvement, but doesn't eliminate the ban. Congress in 1996 passes the Defense of Marriage Act, um, which says that the federal government will not recognize same-sex marriages. Uh, there are also in 1996 and 2004, as the marriage issue arises, there are state ballot initiatives during these presidential election years in which states uh, through voter referenda uh, vote to include in their constitution a ban on marriage equality or recognizing unions between two men and two women. And then, and so, you know, these first three, what they kind of illustrate is that sometimes the jump into national politics can often equal defeat, but then sometimes there's also a historic victory. And in 2003, uh, the Supreme Court issued a decision in Lawrence versus Hardwick that overturned that earlier Bowers versus uh, Lawrence versus Texas, that overturned that earlier case, Bowers versus Hardwick, in which the Supreme Court says, no, sodomy laws are unconstitutional. And this is a really, in 2003, significant historic marker of change. For the first time in US history, criminality is no longer the starting point. You are not in danger of being arrested, prosecuted, and jailed just because you love and live with and are intimate with a member of the same gender. So uh, I, I'm just about to stop here. There's a lot that could be said about the last two decades. Uh, uh, you know, since 2003, I would say the three biggest issues are marriage equality, uh, which achieved success in 2015 with the Supreme Court decision. Uh, a tremendous amount of uh, organizing among in schools and among youth, what things that are called gay straight alliances, thousands of high schools and middle schools now have them. Many more teachers and administrators and staff have come out of the closet. Uh, it's a long way from Anita Bryant's Save Our Children campaign. And then the last thing I, I'll mention is that it's really in the last 15 years or so that uh, gender identity has emerged strongly as an issue in itself uh, with a great deal more of trans visibility and organizing. Um, and there's so much, I could give a whole other talk just on what has happened since uh, 2003, but some of that will be more familiar to us all because it's more recent and we've lived through it. Um, 
So let me finish up by saying, I wanna, if you don't know about it, I would love to call your attention to the Gerber Hart Library and Archives in Chicago. Uh, that's the, its web address. It's um, an LGBTQ circulating library and historical archives that is committed to preserving LGBTQ history from this part of the country. Um, and I'll end with a little bit of self-promotion. My most recent book, which came out last year is called Queer Le Legacies, Stories from Chicago's LGBTQ Archives, uh, based entirely on research at the Gerber Hart Library. And it contains, uh, it's 38 short, you know, five and six page chapters about a different person, a different event, a different organization, um, a different campaign uh, in the Chicago area going back to the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, so uh, let me stop here. Uh, and uh, I'm Jennifer, if you want to pass on to me questions or comments, I'm happy. Oh my gosh, John, that was incredible. First of all, you are, <laughs> <laughs> you're very thorough. It was almost like the most thorough cliff notes because clearly every <laughs> single historical event that you mentioned, every person that you mentioned, there's so many stories under every piece of ephemera that you showed. I mean, there's just so much history and we love that you condensed it to this really, really great timeline for us. It, it is very helpful to see the history in the way that you presented it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and Emily, who is attending has said, I love how your presentation shows what a roller coaster movements can be going back and forth with progression. Do you have one particular person or event that you look at and hope that things can get better when there is pushback even still today? Uh, well, you know, I mean, the biggest area of pushback right now is around transgender individuals, that um, they re uh, the transgender community really is coming together, uh, that have visible leaders and organizations. And, but they're starting to get, just like there were all those laws against marriage equality, there are starting to be laws passed in different communities and states uh, about allowing trans people to say, I am male or I am female, and then live accordingly. And it's most clearly demonstrated in terms of access to public restrooms. Um, so it's, I would say right now that it's, it's uh, transgender that is um, eliciting the most active organizing against the movement. And it's leading to more and more lesbian and gay organizations coming out in support of transgender rights. Thank you for that. Um, another question from Emily, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna pronounce this correctly because I might've missed this in the presentation. Do you know why the was it Matician Society? Matician? Mattachin. Mattachin Society and Daughters of the Bilitis chose their names. You said they were meant to be subtle, but is there an inside reference? The, well, there is actually. I mean, and it goes back to like uh, the Mattachin has um, had a, was a reference to um, the uh, some, a, a phenomenon in the Middle Ages, I believe it was, uh, where uh, people, men, were uh, violating sort of norms. You know, they were sort of coming, in effect, coming out as sexually or gender-wise different. And the Daughters of Belitis goes back to uh, uh, the ancient Greek world, and uh, I don't know the specific reference, but it's a daughters of Belitis were figures from ancient Greece of women who loved women. And, you know, almost no one is going to know what Mattachine was or Belitis was. And so that's why they used names like that. Clearly it worked on me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm curious to know, John, about in your own experience, you know, with, with your expertise lying in history and in women and gender studies in your years at UIC, what kind of change did you see in women, the women and gender studies program? And was it very typical for people to be studying in both fields and teaching in both fields in the way you were? Because they come together wonderfully. 
Well, you know, it's it, initially when uh, initially, like in the 70s, quote, women's studies programs were founded. And this was an, an amazing advance. And it was happening in universities and colleges around the country. Um, and uh, gay, a gay and lesbian studies develops much later. I mean, it's not until I would say really the 1980s that you begin to have enough literature that's been published that's positive literature that you could really begin organizing and teaching courses on this. Uh, and, and so by the, by the latter part of the 90s and the early part of the uh, 20th, 21st century, uh, and many women's studies programs are beginning to relabel themselves like gender and women's studies or uh, gender, women and sexuality studies so that they're uh, explicitly inclusive and begin including courses like that. And, you know, when I started teaching at UIC in 1999, uh, it was still called the women's studies program. And uh, a few, a little bit at, soon after that, they changed the name to gender and women's studies. And, you know, they have a number of courses that they offer on LGBTQ studies and experience, so. Excellent. And I want to make sure I open up to any other questions that are coming in. I don't want to be the only one to ask John a few questions, but we do have him for a few more minutes and we're so grateful for his time. So I'd love to get any questions out there answered. Um, John, I know I'm curious to hear your thoughts about whether or not intersectionality of the, the varying different identities and communities and issues that you hit on being very uh, dismantled or fractured or separated in the 70s, do you see that being improved in the 2010s especially? Well, in yes and no. So yes, there's improvement. I mean, for instance, you know, in recent years, or not even just most recent years, but over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, one increasingly will see uh, a person of color who becomes the executive director of a national organization, a national gay and lesbian or LGBT organization. Whereas in the early 70s, you weren't, or in the 1960s, you weren't going to see that happen. But at the same time that that's true and that there's more, uh, quote, sort of integration and working together, uh, especially in people of color communities, there's still a need for independent organizations that are very focused on the needs of community members and on educating their own larger communities. And they can do it better than anyone else. So, so we're living at a point where we have both. We have integration and we also have the continuation of autonomous independent organizations based on, you know, a mixture of identities. And we have another great question that came in. This is from Deb. Deb asks, what are the differences that you're seeing between the city and suburbs for the movement? And I think that's a great question. Oh, well, I wish I could answer that question. I don't think I know. <laughs> I don't think I know that well enough. Um, and partly it's because, um, you know, I, I'm too much of an urban person. So like, for instance, in, in working on um, uh, at the Gerber Hart Library, where I both did research and was president of the board, so many of the collections are focused on Chicago-based organizations rather than organizations that are in the suburbs. And so it still is harder to write that history. Uh, and so uh, one thing I would say is like, if any of you know people involved in LGBTQ organizations in the suburbs, encourage them to donate their papers to the Gerber Hart Library. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wish I wish I could really answer that more, you know, substantially. No, don't apologize for being too urban. We're all very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you also hit on something great for uh, Giving Tuesday. What are some What are some of the organizations out there doing good work that you would like to shine a light on? I know you mentioned Howard Brown Health at the beginning. Well, I was. I mean, Howard Howard Brown certainly. I mean, they uh, they've grown tremendously. They have uh, the the head of their organization, David Munar, is so 
skilled as uh, an organizational leader so that Howard Brown keeps growing and, you know, has, you know, it's on the north side, it's on the south side, it has, it reaches out to young people as well as to seniors. Um, it's, you know, a great organization uh, to donate to. And of course, you know, I have my personal interest in the Gerber Hart Library because without it, we, without organizations like that, we wouldn't be able to do uh, the kind of research and writing of history that needs to be done. Uh, another organization that performs valuable work is the Center on Halstead. Uh, but again, that's very much, uh, you know, urban organization. It is really grounded in Chicago. So. No, those are great. Those are absolutely great uh, for everybody to be aware of. Um, last call for questions then from everybody who's attending tonight. And, and again, a reminder that we did record. There was so much rich information that I'm sure each of you will want to watch it again for different reasons to pick out some of the different um, things that you want to revisit. But if nobody has any questions, I'd like to thank John for his time tonight and for spending the evening with us. And it's been great to get to know you and your work. And we so appreciate it. Well, and thank you for the opportunity. I, I, I enjoy talking about this history and telling people things that most of us don't know about. Excellent. Well, thank you, John. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Thank you so much.